So what is the story of America? Is there such a thing? Is there only one story or are there many stories? And if there are many stories, how are they woven? Can they be woven together to tell the story of America? Uh, those are the questions we'll seek to answer here in this conversation. The fourth installment of Dr. Andrew Roth's The American Tapestry Project, We Tell Ourselves Stories. As we turn our attention uh, now to look at the American dream, success stories, Horatio Alger, and a nation of hustlers. Hello and welcome to the Jefferson Educational Society's Digital Programming. I'm Ben Spagan and I'm the Vice President at the Jefferson and I'm a contributing editor at the Erie Reader. Joining me is Dr. Roth, a scholar in residence at the Jefferson and is the host of the American Tapestry Project radio program airing on WQLN Public Media and available online at WQLN.org as well as the NPR One app. Now, after a deep examination of 1968, the year America shattered, according to Smithsonian Magazine, Dr. Roth launched his exploration of the American narrative or narratives. In August, Dr. Roth and I took a look at the overview of his American Tapestry Project. And on September 29th, we began looking more deeply into Dr. Roth's Tapestry Project, looking at the weaving of that tapestry thread by thread over the course of several episodes as we examined the American narrative. Now, videos of those programs, as well as other discussions featuring Dr. Roth, are available for on-demand streaming at jeserie.org. In past episodes, we've examined humans as storytellers, freedom's story, home in the United States and abroad, and freedom's fault lines, focusing on race and gender. In this episode, we'll examine the American dream, success stories, Horatio Alger, and a nation of hustlers. Now, a quick note on Dr. Roth, prior to joining the JES team, uh, he had had an accomplished career in academia from lecturing to leading. He taught various courses before going on to serve in administrations in Erie and lead the Notre Dame College in Cleveland as its president before retiring and being named president emeritus. Breaking free from the tightening grip of retirement, Dr. Roth heeded the call to serve as the interim president of St. Bonaventure University. Now, seeing his vulnerability when it comes to maintaining a relationship with retirement, we at the Jefferson wrangled him in, and he has been serving here ever since as a scholar in residence, offering numerous lectures, producing plenty of publications, and facilitating the Ramey Fellowship Program. Now, since this conversation is first airing live on the Jefferson's Facebook page, we'll work our way through as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as we host this event. If you have a question, just leave it in the comments section below. If you're listening to or watching a later broadcast of this event, uh, please send, still send us your questions and comments and we'll get them along to Dr. Roth. And for more information about both past and upcoming Jefferson Educational Society programs and publications, please visit jeserie.org and be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Dr. Andrew Roth, thanks for coming back for part four. Yeah, it's hard to believe, Ben. This is part four. That we've been doing this now for a month. Today, part four, the American dream, success stories, Horatio Alger, and a nation of hustlers. And hustlers has those kind of, uh, oh, uh, winking quotation marks around it because we're going to look at the word hustlers in, in two senses of the word, hardworking, energetic people, but also in the pejorative sense of the word, perhaps people who on occasion will cut a corner. Uh, I'd like also to point out that, and just repeat what you said, that a, ver a variation of this series is available on WQLN's website, the American Tapestry Project. It's also on NPR One, Spotify, Google, and I actually was told by someone from out of town they found it on Apple Podcasts. So I think you can find it almost on any podcast search engine. And that version of the American Tapestry Project, uh, admittedly, is very similar to this, uh, but there is information and stories in there that aren't in this one, uh, because they aren't completely in sync, plus that one has a great deal of music. But in any event, today, part four of the American Dream success stories. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the theory behind this whole concept, except to say that getting the American story is critical because humans are storytellers and as we've said uh, over these previous three episodes, and for those who would like to do a little more of a deep dive, if, if you did not see uh, episodes one, two, or three, a little more of a deep dive into what we mean by all of this, you can find that in the first 10, 15 minutes of those episodes. But the basic idea is that humans are storytellers. They make sense of their experience by telling one another stories. It seems to be an innate human capacity, arguably the, the capacity that makes us humans. And it's what holds cultures together. And so trying to 
trying to understand the stories we tell ourselves is critical because, as I said, it holds cultures together. And uh, in a kind of quick review of the basic idea is the American Tapestry Project, and we use the metaphor of tapestry, a special kind of weaving uh, that, that tells a story. And in a tapestry, the warp threads, and I won't get into the uh, minutia of, of weaving because I'm not entirely certain. I haven't annoyed some genuine weavers out there by, by getting it slightly wrong. But basically, fundamentally, there are warp threads that hold the entire thing together that in a tapestry are not visible, uh, but they are foundational. And in, in, in the American tapestry, if you will, those foundational threads are freedom, equality, and opportunity our 244 year and counting experiment in self-government, and perhaps the greatest challenge uh, of all of those, uh, blending diverse people, people from literally all over the globe into a people, as in we the people in our foundational documents, particularly the preamble to the Constitution. That, that's really the key. And then there are, you know, the weft threads, the surface stories, and these are themes. Thread one, you know, we tell ourselves stories. We talked about that last week. We explored, or two weeks ago, I guess I'm losing track here. Two weeks ago, we did Freedom Story at Home and Abroad, the American Creed. Last week, we looked at Freedom's Fault Lines. Uh, and Freedom's Fault Lines may actually be almost a foundational thread. Uh, it's really the story of the people who were excluded from the benefits of freedom in our foundational documents who then have spent the last 200 and not quite 50 years arguing for their in, arguing, fighting, struggling for their inclusion by appealing to our foundational values. So the, the, the ongoing, and it is an ongoing struggle as we even watch in this 2020 presidential election uh, between the excluded struggling to be included and certain parts of the included trying to prevent them. Today, success stories, Horatio Elger, A Nation of Hustlers, we've already talked about that. Next week in the concluding episode of the mainstream anyways, we'll talk about the immigrant's tale and something I call the fusion thread, the ever expanding definition of we the people. So for today, we're gonna to take a look at business. Uh, we're gonna take a look at what Americans think of business, what Americans think about their commercial reality from the early days of family farms and small towns and red barns through Benjamin Franklin and the self-help industry to the rise of industry as exhibited by that factory there. And then of course, Wall Street finance, high tech and Silicon Valley. And we mentioned those hustlers earlier, uh, the people who would scam the system, uh, perhaps most benevolently or most benignly depicted in the that 19, I guess it's a much older film. I guess I'm revealing my age. It doesn't seem that old to me, but upon reflection, it is probably pushing 50. That's unbelievable, actually. It's probably almost a 50-year-old film, uh, The Redford Newman, The Sting. But in any event, today we're going to talk about business and strategy. We're going to talk about business and whether or not Kelvin Coolidge was right when he said the business of America is business. Uh, there's some reason to believe Cal never said it. He was a man of few words. Uh, for example, this joke here, I don't know if, it, if people on the course, they're watching it at home on, or if they're with us, they're, they're looking at their computer so they can probably see if this young woman is tempting him. Say, Mr. President, I might bet my friends I could get you to say more than three words. What do you say? An old silent Cal won his bet, you lose. <laughs> uh, well, Coolidge may or may not have said the business of America is business, but even if he didn't say it, he would have been right had he said it. Uh, the business of America in many ways is business from the days of small, well, handicrafts and colonial era, uh, pioneers, that's a sod, that's literally a sod house, hence the name sod busters in Nebraska and settling the great Midwest. Uh, the 19th century, the rise of railroads and automobiles down to today, the age of robots and agribusiness. Uh, and Colin Powell uh, speaks probably here to the, the most positive sense of the word hustler. Uh, Americans are, are hardworking, determined people. And that has probably been, and we're not the only hardworking and determined people in the world, but that, that really was our character and is our character for much of our history. But there's an interesting dichotomy. Uh, and the interesting dichotomy is, and we're here speaking for a thing called the Jefferson Educational Society, and it's an argument as old as the country because it's two initial proponents or opponents 
were amongst the founders. Uh, there's the Jeffersonian view, uh, what we could call Jeffersonianism. Uh, and the Jeffersonian view, there's Tom, uh, is that we're in a, I'm gonna back that up just one bit to go back, that we're a nation of small farms and people living in small towns and independent farmers and yeomen. Now always there was, as in Shakespeare's The Winner's Tale, there was always the spider in the cup. What do you do about, or what? how does slavery fit in all of this uh, benign, wonderful, small town America of free yeoman farmers who were freeholders, owned their own land, worked their own land, they were really answerable to no one. That's the Jeffersonian myth of Americans as freeholders, yeoman farmers who were answerable to no one. Jefferson really didn't believe in factories and that, and he considered people who did not own land, but who worked in factories to be wage slaves, actually. Uh, it's an interesting phrase. And Jefferson probably, uh, uh, well, I was about to use a fancy word. Jefferson probably expounded that theory uh, most in, in the greatest detail in his, the only book he actually ever wrote. He was a great essayist, uh, but the only actual book he ever wrote was Notes on the State of Virginia, in which he talked about that. So the Jeffersonian vision is one way of looking at America as the small towns, small farmers, independent yeomen, and it was yeomen, uh, independent uh, people protecting their self and their liberty and providing for their family. The opposing view is the view of industry, manufacturing, automobiles, banking, finance, debt, today high tech in Silicon Valley. And that great exponent was Alexander Hamilton, who was truly visionary when in the 1790s he wrote his report on manufacturing and he wrote his report on banking, Hamilton envisioned a world that didn't exist. That's what's so astonishing in, in some ways, if one goes back and reads these things. He envisioned a world of, of cities and towns, of manufacturing, and that that manufacturing would be scaled by the use of finance and debt to create capital. Uh, that view of the world was in, if not direct, at least in opposition to the Jeffersonian view. So the Hamiltonian view of the world is a world of manufacturing, entrepreneurialism, and all of that is fueled by debt and finance. The Jeffersonian view is small town America, independent farmers. And actually, as we look at the 2020 presidential election, or as we sit here in Erie County, Pennsylvania, without too much of a stretch, you can see those two themes writ in our county politics. And since we're allegedly a bellwether, bellwether, excuse me, a bellwether state, and we're the bellwether county in the state, apparently, according to articles in the Washington Post and New York Times recently, and we have all these big time out of town reporters coming in to see what we're thinking in Erie. Well, the reason they're here is Erie appears to be an almost perfect split. You have Greater Erie, which I'll call Erie, West Mill Creek, parts of Harbor Creek, parts of Summit, north of 90. To be simplistic, it's not quite that clean, but to be simplistic, north of 90 tends to essentially have a Hamiltonian uh, entrepreneurial commercial vision of the world, and south of 90 tends to be Jeffersonian, if you will, that's small town farms. And it's an almost perfect split because I'm just going to use this as a, uh, as a marker. In our last county executive race, I think 2017, well, uh, actually next year is a county executive election, I believe 2021. In 2017, I believe the incumbent county executive, Kathy Dahlkemper, won by, and correct me if I'm off, Ben, by something like 307, 317 votes out of something like 50,000 cast. And like um, also there was another election, the, the county um, controller election, I think, between Kyle Faust and Mary Schaff, I think, came down something like 16 votes. I mean, it was... a, a uh, talk about a tissue paper thin margin. Well, that split, and I realize this is a bit of an oversimplification, it's an analogy, <laughs> you know, it's a metaphor, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but that split in our local politics is a, 
I was about to say a faint echo, but it's not really a faint echo. It's an echo of this defining contrast in American culture between the Jeffersonian vision and the Hamiltonian vision. And the facts of life are, and we have not yet in our politics figured out how to solve this, but the facts of life are, we tell ourselves we're Jeffersonians, but we live in Alexander Hamilton's world. Uh, I can't, I should have uh, gotten the exact percentage. I'm sure someone in the audience probably has the exact percentage, uh, but something on the order of 80% of all, 80 to 85% of all Americans live in urban areas now, or urban suburban areas, not in rural areas. Uh, and that, that would be a whole other series to trace out that, that shift uh, from the late 19th through the 20th century. So that's the key division. Uh, we have here, this blank slide is, and this is gonna be largely talking about Erie, now that I think about it, north of 90, although once upon a time you had Union City Chair and Cory was a bustling city with multiple industries. But the history of Erie County business and our colleague at the Jefferson, Judy Lynch, has done an entire series on this and it's really quite interesting. But here on one slide it is a brief history of Erie County business. And this first image, of course, is that's what the dock used to look like, folks. <laughs> that's the public dock or Dobbins Landing. That, that's what it looked like in the uh, uh, middle of the 19th century. Uh, and that is, it was a fishing town. Erie, as, as our colleague David Frew has written on a couple of his base, uh, Bayfront uh, articles, was once the, the freshwater fishing capital of the world. But that, and that would have probably, even that's not really Jeffersonian if I look at the, sh you know, the fleet, that's not even really Jeffersonian, but it's closer. Uh, but that quickly gave way in the late 19th, early 20th century to heavy industry, General Electric, Hammer Mill, uh, the level manufacturing on 15th Street, I believe they made washing machines. Uh, this one slide captures a whole lot of different things in Erie, uh, from large and small to medium-sized uh, entrepreneurs. Griswold, cast iron cookingware, which is now, of course, uh, lit literally heirloom pieces, if you happen to own one, that's an authentic Griswold cast iron skillet. Uh, Mark's Toys, uh, long gone, but once uh, one of the major toy manufacturers in the United States. Then, of course, uh, in the late, in the middle and late 20th century, Zern Industries was dominant, but that's all begun to change. You can see, actually, the, the history of American enterprise, some ways in the history of Erie Enterprise, uh, from fishing to small industry to large industry, General Electric. We are now in the world of high tech with Velocity Net. Gannon University, and I, I base these on the size of employees. Gannon University is a major factor. Healthcare, UPMC Hammond, and of course nowadays, a bigger part of Erie's industry, industry might not even be the right word, is uh, tourism. And I'm simply using Sarah's at the beach as an emblem for all of tourism. And of course, the, there now is that, that entrepreneurial spirit is uh, reborn in, in such things as radio, Radius Co-Works and other uh, beehive attempts to uh, nurture and inspire entrepreneurialism and as testimony to Alexander Hamilton's world uh, not only is fishing and farming not Erie's major industry but Erie's major industry is finance or at least as it's represented by Erie Insurance and and that's a, a, a significant change but Erie was built by entrepreneurs, both large and small, and we can never underestimate or understate the value of small business in Erie. Uh, that would require multiple slides to go through a history of all of the different small businesses in Erie. But they've been important because entrepreneurialism is really an Erie characteristic, and it's an American trait. Americans are entrepreneurs. And, and this slide is a slide of the famous ones, but today I'm not going to talk so much about the famous ones. Uh, George Washington may have been America's first genuine entrepreneur uh, and the first person in some ways to abandon, um, I never thought of it that way, but in some ways the first person to abandon Jefferson's vision when he discovered that uh, it was getting increasingly difficult to make a living uh, as a tobacco planter he pivoted and became what we would call today a commercial farmer. Uh, but he also created a fishery in the Potomac River and he also created a distillery and sold his own liquor. 
So, uh, and actually Washington was the wealthiest man of his time, but probably the first genuine, if I were going to use this uh, language, uh, entrepreneur was Benjamin Franklin. Uh, he was, uh, if, he, if, if he's not an entrepreneur, no one was. And uh, he, uh, through printing and newspapers and publications, uh, became one of the wealthiest people in the country and actually did what most people fantasize about. He essentially retired at 45, uh, which is, uh, I think, many people's goal. He actually did it. And of course, you know who these people, I assume our audience knows who these people are, John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, and bringing it down to the present, Martha Stewart, Bill Gates, and Jeff Bezos. But today, I'm going to take a look at uh, two entrepreneurs that perhaps most people don't know a lot about, and probably should. Uh, Stephen Smith is arguably the most accomplished Pennsylvanian that most people have never heard of. And we're going to take a look at Stephen Smith's career. And Annie Malone was the first African-American female millionaire. She was a cosmetic entrepreneur in the late 19th, early 20th century. But these people were all, and all speak to the American uh, genius for entrepreneurship. Let's take a look at Stephen Smith. He has a historical marker at 1050 Belmont Avenue in Philadelphia. So at least he is noted by those who uh, have done their Pennsylvania history. He was born a slave in Dauphin County, Pennsylvania, sometime around 1795. It's not known for certain. He had a tremendous business career in Columbia, Pennsylvania, which is in Lancaster County, and then later in Philadelphia. He was an abolitionist. Then later in life, he was ordained in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and he was a major philanthropist of the late, of the middle 19th century. And when he died, just, I think, 1871 or 72, I have a later slide with that, he was the wealthiest African American in the country. As I said, he was born a slave in Dauphin County, Pennsylvania in 1795. His mother, Nancy Smith, uh, his mother was Nancy Smith, his father was unknown. I actually felt weird writing the word. He was owned by the Cochran family. It just seems to be so metaphysically offensive to say that someone was owned by someone, but he was owned by the Cochran family. His mother, Nancy, died at the age of 94 in 1853. But at the age, it, on July 10th, 1801, and look at that date compared to 1795, he was six. At the age of six, he was indentured to General Thomas Boud or Boudet. Now, people would say, well, how did he pull off what I'm going to tell you later? And well, he got a break. Most of us who have succeeded, if we're honest with ourselves and if we're honest with others, at somewhere we got a break. It might have been just as simple as you were happened to have the great good fortune to be born into the right family, or somewhere along the way, someone gave you a leg up. Well, General Thomas Boo turned out to be a good guy. He taught Stephen how to read. He actually, this was probably a bit of an overstatement, treated him almost as, a, as an adopted son and began to teach him the lumber business that he was in. By the way, this is not Stephen Smith. Uh, this is a stylized image of uh, Solomon, Solomon, ooh, excuse me, Solomon Northrop from 12 Years a Slave but there are no images for the obvious reason of Stephen Smith as a child or young, a boy or a young man. In any event, uh, on January 3rd, 1816, when he would have been about 21 years of age, he borrowed $50. The record's a little unclear about that, but I believe he borrowed or General Bood left him, lent him $50 to buy his freedom. And so at the age of 21, Stephen Smith was now a free black man in America. He married Harriet Lee on November 17th, 1816, that same year. And sometime in 1816, he opened his own lumber business. He was essentially a lumberman and a dealer who would have speculated in buying timber, then milling it and selling the timber to builders. Uh, he did that in Columbia, Pennsylvania, which is in Lancaster County, and it was Columbia, Pennsylvania, because Columbia, Pennsylvania was heavily populated uh, by Quakers, and of course, Quakers were anti-abolitionists, and that was a place to which there was a large free black community in, in Columbia. Smith, over the, now remember we said, I believe, 1817, 1816, 
1834, Smith was one of the wealthiest men in Colombia and had established a fairly significant lumber business. But there were, even in Quaker Colombia, there were race riots, destruction of property, a white, black, white boycott of black businesses. And quite frankly, when you read some of the, the, the primary sources, the newspapers and other pamphlets, there was, you know, that sometimes some things have never changed. There was the white fear of being replaced and, and that resentment anxiety, you know, still unfortunately lingers on in 2020. Uh, Smith, Smith got a uh, threatening letter. You, know, you must know your presence is not agreeable. The less you appear in the assembly of whites, the better it will be for your black hide. Smith left Columbia then and left his, and left his lumber company under the operation of his partner, William Whipper. That is, that is, by the way, an image of William Whipper. And Smith moved to Philadelphia. And in Philadelphia and Cape May, New Jersey, with his partner, Ulysses B. Vidal, using the money and the capital he had accumulated in Columbia, began developing coal mines, lumber yards, railroads, real estate, and banking. He created a railroad linking Lancaster and Baltimore with William Goodrich of York, Pennsylvania. And he had large real estate holdings in Philadelphia, numerous holdings in Columbia, Lancaster, and Philadelphia. For example, in Philadelphia, he owned 52 brick homes, uh, which in antebellum Philadelphia before the Civil War would have been a major, major landowner uh, and landlord. Uh, he was known as Black Steve. He became the wealthiest African-American, as I said a little while ago, prior to the Civil War. But he was actually more than just a businessman. He never forgot who he was or where he came from. He was also an abolitionist. In 1831, he led a meeting in Columbia opposing the American Colonization Society. And very briefly, the American Colonization Society was a group that advocated the recolonization of African Americans to Liberia, to Africa, and to elsewhere in the Caribbean. Uh, the ant, uh, Smith opposed that because in Smith's mind, and correctly so, he was as American and black African Americans were as American as anyone else, and he knew he 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 knew no more about Africa uh, than you and I know about wherever our grandparents or great grandparents or great great grandparents came from. In 1834, he became an agent for Freedom's Journal, and, and the Freedom's Journal was the first black-owned newspaper in the United States. It was in New York City. And later, and it's kind of obscured here with the picture of uh, John Brown, that is John Brown, uh, he became uh, involved with the Emancipator, which was the official paper of the American Anti-Slavery Society, which opposed slavery prior to uh, the Civil War. In the 1840s and 1850s, he was an Underground Railroad operator. Uh, you will recall, I said in the previous slide, he owned railroads, and they perfected the system of building false walls inside of boxcars so that they could smuggle people out of. Baltimore uh, was a major departure point for fugitive slaves, because from Baltimore across the Chesapeake end of Pennsylvania, and you were free. And so it was a, a short hop so that if you could, if a, if a fugitive slave could make it to Baltimore, they could then get them into Pennsylvania. Uh, Frederick Douglass did that, although he did not come on, uh, well, you know, that's interesting. I don't know. I have to check David Blight's work on Frederick Douglass, whether or not he, because there was in Frederick Douglass's escape from Baltimore at one point in time, he was literally on a, a, on a train, but as I recall, he was actually sitting in a, uh, about to say Pullman car. Pullman cars didn't exist then, but he's actually sitting in a passenger car. But anyways, uh, Smith became a great supporter of Frederick Douglass, Henry Highland Garnet, uh, and John Brown, and Smith helped organize the American Reform Society and attended the first meeting of the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society. So he's an abolition. So he's a highly successful businessman in a society that would have been determined to prevent him from doing that. And not only was he a highly successful business person, he was an abolitionist, but he was actually more than that. He became a minister and a philanthropist. He was ordained a minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church in uh, 1838. He was a member of Philadelphia's Bethel African Methodist Church, which my friend, the Reverend Dale Snyder, the former pastor of uh, St. James A.M.N.E. Church here in Erie, 
tells me what is known in amongst African-American Methodists as the Mother Church. In 1857, he built Zion Mission and another in Cape May, New Jersey. He founded the Home for Aged and Infirmed Colored Persons, donated the land and paid for the construction, and he purchased the Olive Cemetery as a burial ground for African-Americans. And he died on November 14, 1873, having lived to see the emancipation and having lived to see Reconstruction, but perhaps fortunately for him, he did not live long enough to see a Reconstruction betrayed. So that's Stephen Smith. He's a Pennsylvanian. Uh, he's arguably one of the most successful and important Pennsylvanians in Pennsylvania history that most people, unless they spend some time looking at it, have never heard of, or if they've heard of, they don't know much about him. Annie Malone, 18. 1877 to 1857, so she lived to the ripe age of 80. Annie Malone was an entrepreneur, and one of the first female African-American entrepreneurs and the first female African-American millionaire. She was born in Metropolis, Illinois to former slaves, Robert and Isabella Cook. Uh, her father had actually served in the Union Army, the first Kentucky Cavalry in the Civil War. She was orphaned, unfortunately, at an earlier age and raised by her sister at Peoria, Illinois. Although she didn't graduate from high school, while she was in school, she took a particular interest in chemistry. And she developed a product called Wonderful Hair Grower, a product that would straighten African American women's hair. And she sold her Wonderful Hair Grower in bottles from door to door. She built a cosmetic empire. In 1902, she moved to St. Louis where she hired three assistants and sold her hair, her hair products from door to door. Due to the high demand in 1902, they opened up their own shop and then she launched a wide advertising campaign and recruited many women to sell her products. In fact, you can get, there's an indirect link between her products and Madam C.J. Walker's products, which you can still buy, they actually are still sold today. Unilever, I believe, now owns the brand. But Madam C.J. Walker, and I think there was a Netflix original on her that somewhat whitewashes the story. Uh, Madam C.J. Walker was actually a woman named Sarah Breedlove Davis. She operated in Denver, Colorado, and she was one of Annie Malone's sales, regional sales reps. In modern 21st century jargon, we'd say she was one of Annie Malone's regional sales reps uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century. But patent laws were not as strict as they were then, and it's not, it's arguable whether these could in fact be patented. So in any event, uh, Walker, uh, Breedlove and Davis, who, who became known as Madam C.J. Walker, uh, left Malone's company, took the original formula and created her own brand. That prompted Annie Malone to create what she called Poro Products, which was the last words of her name. Uh, she was married, her first husband, Aunt, uh, Pope, so, and her sister, Laura Roberts. So the first two, so two, first two letters of each name, Pope and Roberts gave them Poro. Uh, they then copyrighted that and, and patented their products to prevent other people from copying them. In addition, Malone created Poro College. And I see the screen sharing emblem up there might be obs obscuring it, but it said they created a curriculum that addressed the whole person. And this really happened uh, in the early 20th century in the 19, teen, 19 te aughts and teens. And this needs to be put into the context of a movement at that time in African-American culture, what W.E.B. Du Bois called the Talented Tenth, in which African-American people were arguing for their inclusion, for their inclusion in American society, not only politically by appealing to the foundational values of American culture, but also by trying to cast off the um, all of the, all of the anti-black bigotry of the Jim Crow movement and all of the, the anti-bigotry, the images that uh, Henry Louis Gates uh, chronicled so well in Stony the Road, uh, and to show that they were as sophisticated, as accomplished, and as cultured as white people. Um, and so what they did was cr she created a college to do that. And this college, the, 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 the young women who attended this college, 
We're coached on personal style, on walking and talking, a style of dress to maintain a solid, reputable persona. Uh, and that uh, led to an immense success, so much so that Annie Malone began selling her products worldwide. And at one point in time, she had almost 75, she had created jobs for over 75,000 women. She was so successful that she founded and was a major instrument in founding the St. Louis Colored Orphans Home, which is now in the 21st century called the Annie Malone Children and Family Services Center. It still exists in St. Louis. It's a major uh, social work civic institution in St. Louis. And every year they sponsor a May Day Parade. Uh, it was canceled, unfortunately, in COVID 2020, but this is a picture from the 109th Annie Malone Children and Family Services Annie Malone May Day Parade, May 19th, 2019. It's the second largest African American sponsored parade in the United States. And I'm sure somebody out there will ask or is wondering, well, what's the largest? And the largest is the Bud Billiken Parade and Picnic, the second Saturday in August in Chicago. It was founded by David Kellum in 1929. He was the editor, I believe he was also the founder, but he was definitely the editor of the Chicago Defender, which was the prominent black newspaper of that era. So that's Andy Malone, Stephen Smith and Annie Malone, two archetypal Americans living out the American dream, who I think as difficult as it would be for anyone to accomplish what they did, I think their accomplishments are more, more than noteworthy because they did it in a society that many parts of that society, particularly in the age and the era when they did it, would have been determined to prevent them from doing it. So that's American entrepreneurialism in our American story about hard work and hustling. We also believe in America in the self-help creed, America's can-do creed. Uh, and that has a long history in America, from Ben Franklin through Horatio Alger, who, by the way, was not a character in the Horatio Alger novels. He was the author <laughs> of the Horatio Alger uh, novels, Rags to Riches. That's Bruce Barton, who wrote a book called The Man Nobody Knows, which described Jesus of Nazareth as the world's first great entrepreneurial salesman. Uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Bruce uh, and Dale Carnegie, Joel Osteen, and Andrew Carnegie. But the, what, what do we mean by America's can-do creed? That Americans believe, and I'm not so sure they believe it as much as they once did, and that's part of the social challenge of our time, but Americans essentially believe, yes, you can. You, you can do it. Uh, two great quotes I found that speak to that American sense of endless possibilities the endless capacity for reinvention, uh, the loss of, uh, of believing in, in, in that, I think is a major cause of our social malaise. But the first is the quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, dare to live the life you've dreamed, go forward and make your dreams come true. Henry David Thoreau, go confidently in the direction of your dreams, live the life you've imagined. If we talk about the American dream, we can talk about it politically, we can talk about it economically, we can talk about it sociologically. But if we talk about the American dream in terms of psycho -so uh, individual psychosocial development, this is it. That this notion that you can become anything you want to become, that you can go and reinvent yourself. And Americans have been doing that since the beginning. And the man who invented that was Benjamin Franklin. The first self-help book ever written by an American was the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. But I guess I could argue that it might have been poor Richard's almanac in which he had all wit, the wit and wisdom. We're gonna look at that in a minute. Or Franklin's The Way to Wealth, which he uh, wrote for his nephew. And I'm gonna come back to that. But essentially Franklin invented the, self, the American self-improvement industry. And you have to put it in the context of its times. That was a wildly radical innovation, uh, a wildly radical enlightenment concept. Because prior to that, your place in the world was pretty much ordained by your birth. Where you were born, literally and physically, the, I, when I say literally and physically, the town in which you were born, most people in the 18th century never got more than 25 miles. Actually, I think I've overstated that. I think, if I recall correctly, 
and I'm not entirely sure how anyone went about proving this, but most people prior to the 18th century never got more than five to 10 miles away from the place they were born. Uh, and a great, uh, a very high percentage, a very, very low percentage ever got much further than 25 miles. So to say that you can become whatever you have it in you to imagine, all you have to do is have the courage to go out and seize that opportunity, carpe diem. Uh, from from Horace, uh, that was a wildly innovative idea, and that's one of the things. And talk, Bill talks about it in Democracy in America that made America the great beacon of attraction uh, in the 18th and 19th, and even into the 20th century, and quite frankly, even into the 21st century, as we see with the pressure for immigration at our southern border. There are people in the world who still believe this is the place where you can come and reinvent yourself and become whatever it is you have it in yourself to be. And Franklin began that with his Poor Richard's Almanac. And these sayings from Poor Richard's Almanac have actually become part of the American lexicon. Haste makes waste. Well done is better than well said. Lost time is never found again. I love this one. Uh, as a college professor, the irony is profound. Speak little, do much. <laughs> and everybody's heard early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Well, those are all Benjamin. They didn't just come out of the air, people. Those were all Benjamin Franklin expressions. Um, and then he had his The Way to Wealth, which he had written. Uh, we're going to come back to that in a moment. Uh, some more Benjamin Franklin expressions. If you love life, don't squander time because life is made of time. It's all there is to it. Do all your best today because you never know how much you may be hindered tomorrow. Uh, beware of little expenses. I love this one. Beware of little expenses. A small leak will sink a great ship. I want to go back here just a bit. Uh, the way to wealth Franklin actually wrote uh, for his nephew, Benjamin Meekham, who was the son of Franklin's sister, Jane. Uh, Benjamin could never quite succeed in life. And Franklin kept trying through moral exhortation to help him succeed. And he actually, uh, unfortunately, never took his uncle's advice to heart. He was never quite up to the task. And of course, probably the best self-help book ever written is, and I would say this even to this day, when students would ask me or people would ask me, what's the best book I can read to learn how to you know, function in an organization? I would say, well, if you're fortunate enough to find an original version, get the original, original version with all the cornball uh, statements and Machine Gun Kelly and everything else and Carnegie talking to the warden at Sing Sing Prison. But all of that uh, kind of uh, nostalgic charm aside, I, I would argue that the best book ever written on how to work with people is How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And of course, that Dale Carnegie died, oh my gosh, uh, 60 some years ago, 65 years ago. But to this day, the Dale Carnegie Institute exists. They run workshops in town nowadays. I'm sure they're webinars. And it's probably the most uh, influential uh, public speaking interpersonal relations uh, institute in the country. And Dale Carnegie's maxims uh, from the original book, How to Influence People, don't criticize, condemn, or complain. As he would point out, if you criticize, condemn, or complain, nobody's going to agree with you. They're just going to get their hackles up, mount their defenses, and counterattack. Uh, the, sm the simplest thing you can do to what make yourself welcome is smile. Person's name is the most important sound in any language. I used to tell admissions recruiters whenever you're at a, a college night, if a kid comes up to you in an athletic jacket with their name on, the, on their chest, call them by their name for two things will happen. One, you'll startle them because they won't know how you know their name because they're going to forget it's on the coat. And two, you immediately have rapport because as Dale Carnegie would say, the sweetest sound in the world to anyone is the sound of their own name. And of course, be a good listener. Uh, the only way to get the best of an argument is to avoid it, which takes us back to never criticize, condemn, or complain. If you, nobody's, uh, you can't convince anybody of anything. So if you're arguing with them, all that's going to happen is that people get polarized. The thing to do is to work your way around. Never say you're wrong, because if you tell somebody they're wrong, what do you do? They get defensive. If you're wrong, admit it quickly and emphatically. Let the other person feel the idea is his, not yours. 
and try to see the other person's point of view. And of course, we're talking about storytelling. The most effective way to get people to agree with you is not to argue with them, but to tell them a story about why whatever it is you're trying to sell or whatever it is you're trying to persuade is critical. So that's the self-improvement industry. And that actually has, down to the future, uh, profound implications in our culture. Andrew Carnegie in an article that he, and this is Andrew Carnegie right here, of Carnegie Steel, the forebearer of United States Steel. Uh, Carnegie in a North American Review article in June of 1889, argued for the gospel of wealth by which he meant, not that everybody should be rich, although he had no problem with everybody getting rich, but he actually talked about the fact that he invented the American philanthropy or the American notion of philanthropy, in which he argued that those who had amassed great wealth, as he had done, who had amassed more money than they actually needed for themselves, that they had a moral and ethical obligation to work for the betterment of their society. Now, the cynics in the audience might say, well, that's because he was feeling guilty because he's an old age and he knew someday he's going to run into somebody uh, who might hold him accountable. <laughs> and so he was trying to restore the balance as he aged. I don't know. I'm going to give the man uh, the, um, the benefit of the doubt. And of course, uh, the most obvious manifestation of that is to this day, in October 20th, 2020, there is a Carnegie Foundation in New York City that is actively engaged in promoting education. There is the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. And most people, I don't know, I should know this, I wonder if George Deutsch or, or uh, somebody thinks, I should know this, but I, I think the Erie County Library was a Carnegie Library, but I'm not positive of that. But um, he donated immense funds to build libraries in every town because he thought libraries and books and education was the way out of poverty. And that would be the way to do it. So he wanted to make knowledge commonly available. There's another version on that in the American self-help industry. This is Joel Osteen and the prosperity theology. The prosperity theology is not quite so benign or philanthropic as Carnegie. The prosperity uh, thought, gospel says God wants you to be healthy and prosperous. And so to get there, you have to have faith, positive thinking. We hear the echo of Norman Vincent Peale and donate to religious causes, in particular to me. <laughs> uh, and that would be Joel Osteen and the prosperity theology. So those are the positive aspects of the American entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, I didn't have a slide here, but the, as we try to resolve our Jeffersonian and Hamiltonian dichotomy, uh, the entrepreneurial spirit exhibited by Stephen Smith and Annie Malone, uh, the notion in America that you can become anything you want to become. Uh, all it takes is grit and a willingness, as Benjamin Franklin say, uh, uh, to remember that time, life is made of time, so don't squander time. But there's an, another side, and that is the other side of that meaning or the other aspect of what we mean by uh, hustling. And there are people, P.T. Barnum, although, by the way, there's no evidence P.T. Barnum ever said there's a sucker born every minute. This may be uh, a false attribution. That is P.T. Barnum. But there is also this notion of hustlers that we, um, that, that some people are willing to cut a corner. And that is also in the American grain. And Barnum once made the comment, it is amazing the good nature with which most Americans will accept a bit of bunkum. <laughs> and there is, of course, and of course, you know, you have Paul Newman and uh, the hustler. Uh, and of course, we talked earlier about the sting. And there, there is this kind of ambivalence uh, about the people who uh, can somehow cut a corner. Now, that's because, as Ralph Waldo Emerson said, we live in mid surfaces and the true art of life is to skate well on them. So Emerson kind of understood what Daniel Burstyn was gonna talk about, oh my gosh, about 80 years later in terms of the image and that Americans uh, have created an imaginative life. I call it a mediated world in another series of, of talks but we'll, and book notes. But that is 
true. And P.T. Barnum was the first guy who ever really exploited it, who, who understood it, saw it, and exploited it. And this is P.T. Barnum. And he created his American Museum. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. And his American Museum was a kind of uh, real-time, real-world internet. Uh, and it was a kind of vertical circus in a building on uh, the corner of Ann Street and Broadway in New York City, where he had such things as the Fiji, Fiji mermaid, which was actually the head of a juvenile chimp uh, sewn onto the body of a dead fish. Tom Thumb, uh, he had Chang and Eng, the Siamese twins, the bearded lady. This is the marriage of Tom Thumb. And on a kind of higher level, and I see, unfortunately, she's obscured by Ben and I <laughs> on the screen, so you can't really see her face, but that is Jenny Lind, the Swedish nightingale, who was the great singer of the 19th century. Um, Barnum brought her to America and took her on a tour of the nation, and she actually then anchored uh, at the uh, American Museum. And this is the American Museum at the corner of Broadway and Ann Street in New York City. Uh, it burnt to the ground twice. It burnt to the ground, Barnum rebuilt it, it burnt to the ground again. So you can't keep a good man down. He then founded Barnum and it became Bailey. Barnum and Bailey's The Greatest Show on Earth, the circus in which he essentially took his American Museum on the road. And Barnum was a complicated man. I think actually he was a, a basically a person of goodwill. Uh, he uh, was more complicated than his public image. Yeah, he was a he was a showman. You know, there's no question about that. He was he was a showman, but he was a complicated man. As a member of the Connecticut legislature, for example, in 1865, he was a strong advocate for the adoption of the 13th Amendment banning slave abolishing slavery. Uh, and he was a person of uh, great charity. Uh, so he, he was a more complicated person than the, the, than the myth. And of course, re uh, recently in the last several years, there was a, an excellent musical film about him, The Greatest Showman, which is basically based on the life of P.T. Barnum. But there is another aspect to this, and that's the con man, the guy who would cheat you. And the first con man was a guy named William, perhaps Samuel H. Thompson. And no one quite knows what he looked like. Uh, this is a man named William Thompson that is frequently used as the picture in articles about William Thompson. But I'm not sure that's him. And sometimes it's thought to be this guy in the middle. Melville's The Marvel, The Confidence Man, was based on William Thompson, or at least was inspired by it. Uh, who was William Thompson? And how did he give us the word confidence man? Well, he was the confidence man, and in New York City in the 1840s, he had a, a con game. Well, the, the word con comes from him. The whole thing comes from him. He had a scam in which he would walk up, and he was always well-dressed, always looked very professional, and he apparently had some charm. He would walk up to people on the streets of New York, and after chatting with them for five or so minutes, ask them if you know, tell him his watch was broke and he had several important meetings that he had to go to that day. And would they have the confidence in, that, in him to trust him with their watch and he would give it back to them the next day. And of course, people, unbelievably enough, did. And then he, of course, he never came back the next day because he had pawned it. And eventually he got, he, he tried his game one too many times. And this is actually, I'm not going to read it to the people. Uh, he actually tried the game one too many times. And this is an article from the New York Herald on July 8th, 1849, the arrest of the confidence man. And that's actually where the word con man or confidence man comes from. It comes from William H. Thompson and his sidewalk scheme in New York. And we're familiar with scams. You get robocalls all the time, uh, you know, scam alert, uh, a confidence game. In fact, the scam is defined William Thompson gave us a word, or at least another definition for the word confidence. Uh, it's defined, a scam is a confidence game or other fraudulent scheme for making a quick profit. And you're familiar with these attempts to gain personal information and everybody needs to be, particularly in the age of uh, the internet, Facebook, and uh, now, I, now I get text messages. Uh, it was robocalls, now they're robotext. And this actually leads to an interesting question about the American character to, to end today's presentation. Uh, what is the continuing fascination in America with hoodlums and criminals and gangsters and con men? 
uh, and most people forget uh, or somehow put it aside that the Great Gatsby, Jay Gatsby and the Gate Great Gatsby, which uh, some people consider one of the three or four greatest American novels. If you reread it today, you'll be kind of startled by the racism and misogyny uh, that was just, you know, it was just the air you breathed in that era. Or, of course, the enduring, the, the enduring, excuse me, the enduring uh, fame of The Godfather and interest in it and the, the constant repetition of that film. And that leads to an interesting question in terms of storytelling. Uh, why, what is the enduring appeal of mystery stories and crime stories? And so to end this whole thing a little bit on the notion of storytelling to complete the circle we began with, I think we love detective stories because they make sense of our life, or at least they tell you life can be made sense of. Uh, there's a basic structure to a detective story. Uh, it usually opens with some kind of social gathering. Food is frequently involved and everything appears to be well. And then, something happens. A crime is either committed or a crime more often than not is discovered and that discovery sets chaos loose. Uh, and then the rising and falling action of the whole story is the arrival of the detective, the avenging angel or the knight errant who's going to fix all of this. And detective stories usually end, the Aristophanic, go back to Joan Didion, fancy sense Aristophanic comes from Greek comedy and Aristophanes, and it always ends well. And in fact, in a, in an Arist in, a, in, a, in, a, in a comedy, it always ends with feasting, frequently a marriage, uh, that all's well. And that is that the, uh, the detective has restored peace and order, and life makes sense. And so that what didn't make sense, this crime or this chaos up here, can in fact be made sense of. And I think that explains uh, our ongoing uh, love affair with mysteries and detective stories. And that comes out of uh, the, the American notion of the con man. So in any event, that is the American dream success stories, both the positive and the negative. Next week, the immigrant's tale and the fusion thread. There should be some, yeah. Next week, we'll talk about the immigrant's tale and the fusion thread. So thank you. And I hope uh, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Ben and I have talked about maybe doing a sixth episode after the election in which we just, no fancy slides, we just talk about some of the big ideas or questions that have bounced around. Ben? Yeah, Dr. Roth, thank you so much for that presentation for the fourth installment of the Tapestry Project. And uh, again, highlighting next week, we'll be right back here with the fifth installment, taking a look at the immigrant's tale in the fusion thread as, as we look at the five part series. I love the idea of coming back and being able to talk tapestry and, and break it apart and answer some of the questions that uh, maybe we didn't get a chance to dive as deeply into as we, we would have liked. One of the observations I have, uh, Dr. Roth, is, is the, uh, the interweaving of, of these notions here. And I can't help but pick up on one of the slides you had in talking about uh, the idea of um, you know, the, the, you know, being conned in our lives as Americans. And that, that finds its way into job opportunities and, and uh, economic opportunities with pyramid schemes. And I, I see that blended with the idea of uh, this bootstrapping, you know, we can all do it if we just work harder. And, and you see those uh, perhaps overlapping there with the idea that if you just worked harder but followed my scheme, you too would achieve success like I've achieved because I'm one of the people that have managed to get three people to sign up to help me. You just need to get three more to do that and you too can be at the top of the pyramid. Uh, so I, I, I find that of, fascinating. I, I can think of our current uh, Secretary of Education and I can think of several companies, and I'm not going to mention any specific brands, but uh, and they're both legitimate. I mean, I, I think of one in which uh, I think top salespeople got pink Cadillacs. Uh, the beauty of those things is they speak exactly to what we've been talking about. Uh, you can reinvent yourself. You can be anything you want to become. Uh, and they do walk a fine line. Uh, you know, if the knife blade is hustling, if, if the knife's edge is hustling, or if the high wire act may be less melodramatically, if the, if the line we're walking is hustling, uh, a lot of those schemes, some of which are very legitimate, 
a lot of those schemes, they walk, I don't know if you can see what I'm doing with my hands or I keep forgetting we're on <laughs> camp. You know, they walk a fine line. They could fall either way. Uh, yeah, I think that's a real, that, that's a really astute observation. But I think that's well, maybe next one week, of the, the immigrant's tale and the fusion thread. And I'm looking forward to that one. I'm looking forward to coming back to unpack some of these things. I love your detective piece. Uh, I'd love to be able to unpack too our, our phenomenon with anti-hero stories and, and thinking here and in terms of TV shows, things like The Sopranos, uh, Breaking Bad, as, as we find as ourselves as a culture looking at uh, the anti-hero as our real hero um, and seeing how they play a role in our storytelling and moving forward. But Dr. Andrew Roth, scholar in residence at the Jefferson Educational Society and host of the American Tapestry Project on WQLN Public Media with episodes available on the NPR One app and online at wqln.org. Thank you so much for joining us for this program. Thank you, Ben. And of course, to all of you watching along at home or tuning into a later broadcast, streaming this on demand, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. We look forward to welcoming Dr. Roth back here a week from today, live at noon on the JES Facebook page for part five, the conclusion of the American Tapestry Project series. Uh, and of course, we'll be back a couple of weeks after that to talk tapestry, to break down some of the questions we didn't get a chance to get to, dive a little deeper into the things that we found interesting uh, that we really want to unpack with you, the audience. And of course, uh, for each of the episodes in this series that you want to catch up on, uh, or get a refresher on. Those are all available for on-demand streaming at jeserie.org. Uh, to catch other discussions featuring Dr. Andrew Roth, including uh, looks on 1968, uh, as well as read his book notes series, head over to that website, jeserie.org. Uh, you'll also find videos of other past presentations uh, done by many experts who have visited the Jefferson digitally. Uh, you'll also be able to check out other publications, reports, essays, timely writing, as well as information about upcoming uh, JES discussions. And of course, be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. Be safe, be sound, and thanks for listening and learning with us.